parameterized by a, either a single number z, and, and I had an example which was just a family of cubic polynomials, or parameterized by two numbers, z1 and z2, and we had a family of quartic polynomials like that. Um, in any case, once we had this family of polynomials, um, sorry? Yeah, it's okay, it's just the screen thing. Um, um, we had this family of polynomials, and from that we produced, well, ultimately we, pr we produced some concrete gadget called a spectral network drawn on the parameter space C. Um, it's a kind of network of co-dimension one uh, curves, uh, co-dimension one uh, general walls on C, um, depending on the choice of a phase, which we call theta. And I gave you, in the end, what I gave you was just a concrete construction that just starts with a polynomial and produces this thing. But the way we were thinking of it was that starting with the polynomials, you produce something way more elaborate, which is an n equals 2 comma 2 supersymmetric quantum field theory. In that quantum field theory, there's this supernatural question to ask, which is, um, what are all the BPS states? Or, as we said last time, a BPS state comes with this kind of funny invariant associated with it, a number, which is a complex number. The mass is equal to the absolute value of this number. And so the slightly more refined question was, what are all the BPS states that have phase, where the phase of the central charge is equal to theta? And so this picture is supposed to be the answer to that question. It says, you know, for any point, for any point z, you ask, at that point, is there or is there not a BPS state whose phase is exactly theta? And if there is, then you color that point black, and otherwise you color it white. So this is the picture, which I also drew last time, in the case of the quartic, where I fixed the parameter z1 equals to minus 1, and I'm just letting z2 vary in the plane. Well, to be exact, this is the picture at theta equals 0, if I remember right. I uh, know, this is a picture at theta equals pi over 2, I think. Um, and I wanted to show you um, what the picture looks like as you change the phase partly for fun and partly it'll be important later. Um, so first of all, one thing you notice is, well, okay, let me just show you how, how it moves. So as we change the phase, the thing moves in continuously. And in fact, all through, through all the values of theta, it just moves continuously. There's never a kind of discontinuous jump in this picture. Um, you, can convince, you can convince yourself it kind of had to be like that. Um, okay. Uh, all right, maybe that's actually all I want to say about this right now, and we'll come back to fancier ones later. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's a sort of uh, picture that captures the spectrum of BPS states in this quantum field theory. Um, now, you might reasonably ask, um, is this picture good for anything else? So I want to tell you one other sort of mathematical thing that, this, that these pictures are related to. Um, and for that, I, I need to introduce a little bit more structure. So let's talk about chiral rings. So again, it'll just be some concrete mathematical construction, but let me, to put it in the sort of broader context, so um, if you have a space C, which is the parameter space, really I should say the chiral parameter space, Anyway, some kind of parameter space of the quantum field theory, parameter space of n equals 2 comma 2 theories. So these Cs are examples of that. Um, it carries um, a holomorphic vector bundle. It's a complex manifold, so we could talk about a holomorphic vector bundle, and it carries a holomorphic vector bundle, and not only a holomorphic vector bundle, but it's a holomorphic vector bundle of commutative algebras. So each fiber of this bundle, if you like, is a, is a commutative algebra. Um, call it E. Um, and those commutative algebras are called the chiral rings. So it has to do with the multiplication of operators in, this, in the topologically twisted version of this theory. Um, but we won't need to know that. Um, and the other thing it has is a map from the tangent bundle into E. Um, so every, and the way you should think about that is that the quantum field theory sort of knows its own deformations. If, 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 if you want to deform it, the way you deform it is using one of the operators of the theory. Um, and so every deformation, in other words, every tangent vector to this parameter space, corresponds to some operator of the theory, something in E. Okay, 
Um, now, although it wasn't said this way in the early literature, there's another way of rephrasing this data, um, which is let's define um, phi, a map from the tangent bundle to C to the endomorphisms of E, a holomorphic map, by, okay, so phi of, so v, for via tangent vector, um, for, for via tangent vector, I have to get an endomorphism of E, so I have to get something that can operate on a section of, uh, of E, okay, let's call it little e. So in, in other words, what I need is something that uses a tangent vector, an element of E gives me another element of E. Well, I've got, I've got a candidate because what I do is I take Q of V, now that's an element of E. E is an algebra, so I just take Q of V dot E using the algebra product. Um, okay. Um, so, so the, so the holomorphic vector bundle E comes with this uh, extra gadget phi, and that's a gadget that you've seen, I guess, many times by now. Um, namely, it's a Higgs bundle. So E comma phi is a Higgs bundle over C. So I'm saying these parameter spaces, the spaces where I'm drawing these pictures, are also kind of canonically the basis of some Higgs bundles. Um, and so it's natural to ask, is there any connection between the Higgs bundle and that picture? What does that picture tell you about the Higgs bundle? That's what we're going to try to sort out. Um, okay, so, but first, this was some generality, but I got to tell you now how to make this Higgs bundle in the particular case of these families of polynomials. What's the Higgs bundle going to be? Okay. So in, oh yeah, this two comma two supersymmetric field theory was called the Landau-Ginsberg model, right? LG model. Um, LG model. So in the LG model, um, supersymmetric Landau-Ginsberg model, um, these algebras um, are pretty simple. It's just you take all polynomial functions in one variable, the variable x, um, and then you mod out by the ideal generated by the derivative of w. In higher dimensions, I would mod out by all the derivatives of w. Um, here, uh, w, I think, sorry, yeah, this is for, so W depends on a parameter Z. We're not taking the derivative in that parameter. Think of that parameter as being held fixed. And we're taking all functions mod out by the X derivative of WZ. Um, and then the other thing I got to tell you is what is this map Q? So, and Q acting on some tangent vector, which I'll just write generic, generically as D by DZ, um, so that, I gotta give you an element of E, and that'll just be the Z derivative of W. Okay, let's see how it works in an example. Um, uh, Absolutely, so, so one thing that's, yeah, so if you have a family of field theories, so, yeah, one thing it means is that indeed the, the, all the correlation functions, even the algebra of operators, um, varies you know, in some kind of, kind of locally trivial way over the parameter space. Um, uh, in this case, the, yeah, no, not everything varies holomorphically, but if we were, if we were to restrict to the topological part of this theory. So it's an n equals two comma two supersymmetric theory. You can make a kind of topological twist of it, or said otherwise, you can look only at the operators that are annihilated by some supercharges. If you look at only correlation functions for the special class of operators, which are exactly the ones in this chiral ring here, those correlation functions do vary holomorphically. Yeah, well it's hard because I haven't said what I mean by a theory. So how could I, how could I reasonably do that? 
certainly, right, if you, th if you think of quantum field theory as defined by a Lagrangian, um, then uh, indeed you could literally just explicitly deform the Lagrangian, make, make the Lagrangians be functions of an additional parameter. I mean, that's exactly what happens here. In the Landau-Ginsburg model, in the Landau-Ginsburg model, you literally write down a, uh, an action, and sort of the main non-trivial ingredient in that action is this function w of x. And so here we're just explicitly putting a parameter in that w of x. Uh, don't make me try to do it in real time. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry if, sorry if this is not a, uh, the kind of answer you want. Maybe I can try more uh, uh, offline. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So the, the question is, why don't I why don't I deform it in some um, in some arbitrary way? Yeah. So the, so the statement is that when you make a deformation by adding a chiral operator, um, well, maybe the simplest thing to say is the correlation functions in, in the chiral sector, the, the correlation functions of uh, the operators that are annihilated by the Qs. It is a fact that those correlation functions depend, hol depend holomorphically on the parameters um, entering in the superpotential. Yeah, said otherwise, maybe a better way of saying it is the following. The Lagrangian is constructed from this superpotential, but it's constructed in kind of a specific way. Um, varying the superpotential is not the same as making a totally random variation of the Lagrangian. So the statement is that the correlation functions I'm interested in depend holomorphically on the coefficients in the, um, in the superpotential. For a random deformation, it wouldn't be so. That's what I meant here by saying uh, chiral deformation. But it turns out, in fact, see, the cool thing is that if you make a deformation and you want it to preserve the supersymmetry, if you want it to be a deformation which keeps the theory n equals 2, 2 supersymmetric, there aren't that many ways to do it. Um, there's basically two ways, chiral and twisted chiral. One of them is this kind of deformation where everything is automatically holomorphic. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, let's talk about it later. <laughs> um, uh, so, so yeah. So I wanted to I wanted to write concretely uh, um, what this Higgs bundle is. So let's do that. Where's the eraser? Uh, Um, so in this cubic example, um, so to write this in just an absolutely, um, uh, well, let's see, all right, what is this? So easy is C of x mod out by W prime of x, which in this case is just uh, x squared minus z, mod out by that ideal. Um, so it has a trivialization, um, or it has a, each EZ has a basis, so it gives a global trivialization, given by, say, 1 and x. I have to write x squared, x squared is already equal to z. Um, uh, then relative to that basis, so, so I've got the, a rank 2 trivial holomorphic vector bundle over my parameter space, which is c. Um, uh, and then the only other thing I have to give you is the Higgs field. So let's write the Higgs field. Um, so the Higgs field acting on the tangent vector d by dz is, well, that's supposed to be the z derivative of w acted by multiplication. The z derivative of w is minus x. So it's minus x acting by multiplication. If you work out how minus x acts by multiplication in this basis, you see it's a little 2 by 2 matrix. It's minus 0, 1, z0. So concretely, there's your Higgs bundle. The, the Higgs field is this times dz. Um, yeah, thanks. No, 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 I meant phi at d by dz. I, I'm, I'm giving you already the Higgs field using that formula. But this, this is the formula for the Higgs field. Um, uh, okay, and, and similarly, um, uh, in the Kordic example, 
okay, by similar computations, which you can see in the notes, but I'll just write the, uh, the result. Um, so here, E is isomorphic to uh, C3 with a basis one X and X squared. And the Higgs field, so now, this is a Higgs field on a higher dimensional space, right? This Higgs field on C2. So phi of D by DZ1 comes out to be this matrix, 0, 0, 1, Z2, Z1, 0, 0, Z2, Z1. Um, and phi of D by DZ2 is minus 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, Z2, Z1, 0. So this is a Higgs bundle over C, which is C2. Now, actually, in defining a Higgs bundle over a higher dimensional space, I guess there's one condition that probably hasn't been mentioned explicitly because usually uh, we tend to talk about Higgs bundles over uh, one-dimensional spaces. Um, in higher dimensions, there's an extra condition you put, which is the bracket of phi with phi is zero. <laughs> so concretely, what that means is that this matrix should commute with this matrix. But that's true because the chiral ring is commutative. These are all multiplication by different elements of the chiral ring. So we automatically get a, an honest Higgs bundle over this higher dimensional thing. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so so far I told you about a Higgs bundle, um, some simple canonical Higgs bundle that exists in this world. Um, I didn't tell you yet what it has to do with the picture I drew. Um, to tell you that, I have to introduce yet a little more structure. Yeah. Um, that's a reasonable, okay, I just haven't thought about that. Uh, presumably the reason why you asked this question uh, it, it, yeah, so there's an interesting question. I, I want to answer it to make a point. So, so, um, so Rafe asked, why is this Higgs bundle stable? Um, and I think what, what he has in mind is that there's, there's a solution of Hitchin equations on this Higgs bundle if, just if it's stable. I didn't say anything about Hitchin equations yet. Um, it's true that this bundle is going to carry a solution of Hitchin equations, but this kind of quantum field theory way of thinking of it is, is going to produce that solution directly, you're not gonna get it by solving some PDE. I mean, it's true that it's a solution of the PDE, but you don't rely on some existence theorem of solutions of the PDE. Um, yeah, in a way, I, I sort of don't care whether it's stable, but it must be stable because it has this solution. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so, um, so I wanna tell you a little more structure that it has. Uh, so this Higgs bundle maybe is cool, but maybe you would say not super deep. Um, then there's some more structure in this story, which is a little more interesting, I think. Um, uh, so it's also supposed to carry um, a symmetric C bilinear pairing. Eta, and a family of flat connections uh, which I'll call nabla H bar. So they're gonna be parameterized by H bar in C star, complex number. Um, but they're of a particular form. Um, there's one connection called nabla infinity and then you shift it by H bar inverse times the Higgs field. Um, uh, and these are all compatible with, with eta. Um, uh, oh, and eta is also compatible with the chiral ring in the sense that eta of A and B, C equals eta of A, B, and C. Um, so a lot of structure. Um, I'm not gonna tell you in general how to produce this structure, although it's, it's a super interesting subject. I, gave, I, I put a few references. Um, but I'm just gonna tell you what this structure is in the two examples that, we are, that we're talking about. Um, uh, so, yeah. In the Sokol? Okay, because I don't know what the Sokol is. Um, you want me to write a formula? Okay. Um, eta of f and g, it's a cool formula. So eta of f and g is the residue at infinity of f of x, g of x, 
divided by w prime of x. That's what it turns out to be. Um, uh, uh, but let me just write concretely what it is in, in these particular examples. Um, so, uh, um, so in the qubit case, again, in the same trivialization I was in before, um, this connection, this family of connections, Nabla H bar, is the trivial connection by me, trivial with respect to that basis, I mean, minus h bar inverse 0, z10. That, that was the Higgs field I wrote before. And eta is just 0, 1, 1, 0. That might make you think the whole thing is kind of trivial. Um, oh, let's first say another, another word about this. So this family of flat connections, um, I'm going to want to talk about a little more later. So let me right away make a point that um, you've seen this before, probably, even if you don't exactly recognize it in this form. Namely, so this is a flat connection in a rank two bundle, but this is one of the kind that you can easily convert into a second order ordinary differential equation for scalars, linear scalar differential equation. Um, and the way you do that is just define a section psi to be of the form f of z and h bar f prime of z, function of z, um, the nabla h bar of psi equals zero is just equivalent to saying uh, that the function f obeys the area equation. So h bar squared d by dz squared uh, plus z times f of z equals zero. So this is, this is a nice little second order equation. Um, it's called the Aries equation, the area equation. Um, okay. Um, and in the Cordic case, um, this family of connections, Nabla H bar, looks like this. It's again the trivial connection minus one half H bar inverse times. 0, 0, 1, z2, z1, 0, um, z2, z1, uh, dz1, um, minus h bar inverse times 0, 0, z2, 1, 0, z1, 0, 1, 0, dz2. And so if you look at this, it looks 100% trivial. You say, look, all you did was you took the trivial connection and you added the Higgs field that you wrote down before. Why am I making a big fuss about this? The reason I'm making a big fuss about this is that this is not right. I have to put in the top corner minus h bar. Without that, nothing works. Um, and so there's something, you know, there is some elaborate machine that generates these things. I just want to make the point that it's a somewhat non-trivial structure, even in this very simple world of uh, just families of polynomials over, uh, over C or C2. Um, OK, but if you do exactly this, it has all the structures that I'm claiming there. Um, Okay, now, so, yeah. What is it? You mean, is there some sort of abstract? I mean, that's the thing. The construction of nominal infinity is kind of complicated. Um, let me give you some buzzwords. Is that where the h bar comes from? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. This this h bar is contributing to nabla infinity. Exactly. I didn't want to write a whole matrix of all zeros and a one half, so I snuck it in here. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So buzzwords for this structure are Frobenius manifold, and a buzzword for the construction of this is Saito's primitive form. If you want to look this up, um, or look in the references and notes. Um, uh, anyway, for my purpose, I want to take this structure as a given, and I just want to analyze it. Um, so. Uh, so okay, if someone gives you a differential equation, you want to know what are the solutions of this differential equation. Um, so we want to study the flat sections, and let's actually start with just this area equation, which already has somehow the essential, the essential feature that I want to get at. Um, um, 
the, the explicit ones that I'm going to construct have to do with boundary states of the Landau Ginsburg model. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so, okay, so. Um, so, what are the Nabla H bar flat sections? Um, well, so let's start with the area equation. So I actually want to write the solutions in, it's a little easier to write them in this scalar language. So I'll write the solutions f of z. Um, so, so for the area equation, there's a kind of explicit formula. Well, one explicit formula would be to say that the solution is the area function. That's a true fact. Um, but it's somehow not, uh, not very useful. Um, uh, so let me write a, a more useful formula. Um, uh, I'll write f sub i of z. So i is going to run from 1 to 2. Um, and what I'll do is I'll take a contour integral of the function exponential of w of x divided by h bar um, over some contour without boundary. So I'll call that contour ci. Um, and then by a little manipulation, which I put as an exercise, you can show that any such integral gives you a solution of the, uh, of the area equation. Um, now, so then the problem is, of course, to come up with a contour. So you first say, all right, no problem. You know, I'll just pick a contour. Um, you know, I'll pick a contour like this. Um, well, okay, um, that gives a solution, but the solution is zero because you know this is an entire function, right? Um, so you won't get a good, uh, you won't get anything interesting that way. Um, you need to use contours that go to infinity. But then, if you use contours that go to infinity, you have to be a little careful because, um, in some directions, this function is blowing up as you go to infinity. So what we need is to go to infinity along some direction where this, the real part of w over h bar goes to minus infinity. Um, so we need the real part of w over h bar to go to minus infinity uh, at the ends of ci, at the asymptotic ends of ci. Um, so how do you make such a contour? Um, well, one very convenient way of making them um, is to use a so-called left shed symbol. So I think it, this already came up in a much, much more non-trivial context in uh, Pavel Putrov's lectures. This is like the most baby example of the same thing. Unless he talked exactly about this example. Did he talk about this example? No, he talked about it just in Chern Simon's like infinite dimensional space and so on. Okay, so here we're doing it just in C. Um, so, um, so what's a left shed symbol? Well, what you do is you start from a critical point so let's say, call this x1 um, and this x2. And we'll take these to be the critical points. So w prime of xi equals 0. You remember from last time, there are two, there, here there are exactly two critical points. Um, and now we take the kind of steepest descent path through, the, um, through that point. So let me just sketch what they would look like here. There'd be one going like this. Um, One going like that, and one going like this. Uh. So what, are this, what do I mean by steepest descent paths? So, so CI is the left shed's thimble. through xi, that's the steepest descent path, which means it has, um, along this path, the imaginary part of w over h bar stays constant, and the real part of w over h bar goes to minus infinity. If you start at, any, if you start at the critical point, there's, just, there's a unique path in each direction where that happens. You just follow it to minus infinity this way, and follow it to minus infinity that way. In that way, you get some contour on which this integral is guaranteed to converge, um, uh, and, 
and it gives you a solution of the area equation. So here's using these two critical points, I've got two solutions. That's a basis of solutions for this uh, second order equation. So that's great. Um, it is another good property. If you want to actually, you know, if you want to think about these solutions, they have one very useful property, um, which is that you can easily understand. So this is not an exact formula, but you can easily extract interesting information from this formula. In particular, one thing you can extract is the asymptotic behavior. Oh, I should say this picture is when h bar is real. So this picture, of course, depends on the phase of h bar. Um, this is a picture when h bar is real. Um, now, what we can extract from this, uh, um, from this representation is we can extract kind of asymptotic information about what happens when h bar goes to zero. When h bar goes to zero, this integral is going to be dominated by the contribution very, very close to the, the critical point. And there's a standard method uh, of steepest descent for getting the asymptotics. What you get is that fi of z goes like, I think I got it written correctly, so square root of pi h bar divided by w double prime of xi, that part's not so important. What's important is e to the w of xi over h bar um, as h bar goes to zero um, for h bar real and positive. Yeah, I should have said real and positive. Um, okay, so that's the good news. The good news is that these functions have nice uniform asymptotics. That's a good property for a basis of solutions they have. Um, okay. There is some compensating bad news. Um, the compensating bad news um, is let's think for a minute about what's going to happen when we analytically continue in the parameter z. So this was, this was for one fixed value of z. I've drawn the critical values here. This is x, uh, x1 is like square root of z, and x2 is minus square root of z. Those were the critical values. Now, as we change the value of, uh, the value of z, these critical points move. Um, and at some moment, something discontinuous is going to happen, right? Uh, so like here, in fact, in this picture, you already see a kind of weird asymmetry. I've got a contour here in this sector. I've got a contour here in this sector. I don't have a contour here. Um, you know, why not? Well, OK, it just happened that way. Um, but now, as I vary the parameter z, uh, at some moment, the topology of these contours is going to suddenly change. So. So as we vary z, the contour is ci can jump. Not only can, but will jump. So I guess I'll draw the picture for a different value of z. Um, so suppose that the critical points now are here and here. Then this contour is basically the same this contour C1, but the contour C2, the contour C2 makes a big jump as I change the parameter Z. The moment when it changes, if you think about it, is exactly when